Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all bring it. From Texarkana down to the coast and Dallas down to Houston and everything in between, we are E-T-X Ross! <laughs> Hey y'all, this is Boston Chris with a brand new episode of the ETX Rocks podcast. This week partnered with Studio 333 here in Bullard, Texas. We're sitting here at Studio 333 with Chad Malden with Malden Productions. How you doing? And Nathan Honeycutt, aka Honeycutt Slim. Hello people. He has played with well-known entertainers and musicians throughout his almost 40-year career, including Robert Guthrie, Jack Ingram, Steve Holy, Slim Whitman, Leanne Rimes, Stoney LaRue, the incomparable Don Henley, as well as our very first guest here on ETX Rocks, Miss Katie Lynn. He has appeared on such shows as The Tonight Show, The Today Show, David Letterman, The Grammys, and many, many others. His original compositions and arrangements are regularly featured on National Geographic, Good Morning America, Dancing with the Stars, NFL Films, Martha Stewart, as well as many others. Ladies and gentlemen, ETX Rocks is proud to introduce to you Mr. Milo Deering. All right, well, we're here today with uh, Milo Deering, the great Milo Deering. Yes. <laughs> It's good to be here with Milo. We've got some great questions. It's going to be a good podcast. Uh, Milo is uh, he's a musician, a multi-instrumentalist. He's been around uh, and played with a lot of folks. Uh, some folks that just pop into my mind, some people, some artists would be Jack Ingram. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Milo, along the way. Jack Ingram, uh, Leanne Rimes, of course. You did a lot, the first several uh, records with Leanne Rimes, toured and did her album stuff mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Let's see, who am I missing? Oh, for uh, Texas music fans, we have people like, uh, who's some Texas music folks you've played with? Um, uh, Jason Cassidy. Yeah, right, gotcha. Uh, Aaron Watson. Yeah, oh, Aaron Watson, of course, yeah. Aaron Watson, that's great. And uh, right now... The great Don Henley. He's from Texas. Yeah, that's hey, right. Don't, don't forget Slim Whitman. That was the one that yeah. was me. I've done some recording for Slim. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so lots of great people. Uh, you've, uh, As I mentioned, you've played in the studio, you've played live. You've been around uh, quite a lot and done a lot of great stuff. So anyway, this is going to be an interesting uh, talk. We've got a lot of good questions. We want to sort of pick your brain a little bit, talk to you about your upbringing, your musical influences, uh, experiences on the road, a bunch of cool stuff. We're going to get to all that. But anyway, the great Milo Deering. All right, go ahead, uh, Chris, and we'll, uh, or Boston, I should say. Boston, Chris. Yeah, here. that's right. All right, Mr. Deering, I, I just I know that you grew up near Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, shortly after graduating high school, you started to travel quite often to Dallas to study with members of the Classical Guitar Society. Tell us a bit about the struggle and the motivation it took for a young man to travel so many miles on a dream. Well, uh, growing up in Little Rock, uh, there was not really, I don't want to say bad things about Little Rock. But Little Rock's all pretty right. cool. You know, you hang, <laughs> you don't hey, this is, we're Texans in here, we don't that care. that one. You'll erase that, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I knew that there was uh, a classical guitar program in Dallas, right. and that was the uh, closest. I actually came to Dallas initially to study electronics and uh, realized that that wasn't what I wanted to pursue career-wise. And I had seen some uh, classical guitar players on public television and thought, that's really what I want to do. I got a late start in classical guitar, uh, but I was driving a garbage truck back in Little Rock and wow. driving driving to Dallas every other week to uh, study guitar with uh, Robert Guthrie, who was a professor at SMU. Right. Oh, yeah. How old were you when you started? Uh, classical guitar? Right. 18. 18? That's, I was 18 when I started playing, period. Did you know Frank Kimlico, who uh, had a program in at, Tyler? Yeah, North Texas. I, I knew who he was. I I may have met him once or twice, yeah. but I knew who he was, and he was a fine teacher as yeah. well. Um, I was uh, interested in uh, Robert Guthrie's. He had been a student of Segovia. Oh wow! And yeah. uh, you know he had a pretty cool program there at SMU where you you could get a guitar performance degree without having to take any of the academic stuff and I, that was the program that I was 
Yeah. So it was I, basically I just drive a, gar- a garbage truck during the week just so you'd have enough money to go and study on the weekends. Is that kind of how it worked That's out? That's exactly what what happened. And uh, my dad, he thought that I was just going to be doing the garbage truck for the rest of my life when I told him I was dropping out of electronic school to study music <laughs> and play guitar. He, I know at this, at this real, you know, low key, you know, uh, nobody's heard of institution called SMU, you know. <laughs> But I, I didn't graduate. I, I uh, started teaching and uh, kind of gravitated to that for a while. I would, when I would try to perform, I had an anxiety problem. Really? Hmm. And uh, You got over that, apparently. Well, no, I don't do anything solo. I won't. Interesting. You know, so I, I need a band. <laughs> and would be a side man. That's kind of how things worked out for me. So my dad I, would say, "Solo, yeah, I can't hear you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so in some of my student recitals, I would just fold up and uh, realize that uh, I didn't, I wasn't going to be a classical performer. Wow! Yeah, I could play the music in my bedroom in the practice room. But as far as getting up in front of an audience and playing, my hands would start shaking, and uh, it just wasn't fun. Wow. So I started teaching. Okay. All right. So it sort of based off of that or kind of got me thinking a little bit about uh, your musical influences. I mean, you uh, really, was, was classical guitar, was that where you got your initial musical influences, or was that just sort of a direction you took? What were your first musical influences? Uh, my parents uh, both sang and played. My mom played ukulele and piano, and yeah. uh, my dad played harmonica, and, and uh, they would sit around the house harmonizing and did a lot of hymns, you yeah, know, right. growing up. Uh, and I started playing when I was about eight years old. Okay. My mom taught me how to play the ukulele. and uh, But I was... Uh, Listening to a lot of bluegrass back then, they had all right. you know Flatt and Scruggs, sure, the Wilburn Brothers, they were Osborne all on Brothers, TV. yeah, and uh, they had the Arkansas Folk Festival up there. Okay, and I'd go check that out as a kid. So probably more that than the classical, uh, which came later. Yeah. So. Uh that kind of uh, also gets me thinking a little bit about, you know, obviously I mentioned that you're a multi-instrumentalist. What what instruments do you consider yourself to be proficient at? You know, what, Milo Deering, colon, you know, and then what would you fill in the blank with? You know, what are those instruments that you <coughs> put on your bio? Because obviously uh, you're talking about classical guitar being that sort of that first sort of dedicated instrument that you, uh, that you really zeroed in on. But really, I mean, you're not known as a classical guitarist. You're known as a, as a what? You tell us. Uh, well, musically speaking, musically, musically speaking, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's not a rapper. Cover most of the string instruments, you know, that that would fit in a Americana country folk setting. Uh, yeah, fiddle, mandolin, pedal steel, dobro, right, acoustic guitar. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, just uh, I'm a producer, and I've. You know, I've just let you guys know. I've worked with Milo for a long time, and he's, yeah, he's amazing at all of those things. Well, and then amazing, even stuff yeah. that he wouldn't claim to be amazing at, you see, you put it in his hand. He's still that spoon solo a while ago was pretty. It was awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's right. I just didn't know. I just thought, well, maybe. Well, traffic kept me from. I there, actually probably. have uh, some spoons in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> of course, spoons are sports. Well, let me go for something else. Let's do that. <laughs> sure, that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, Milo. Um, Back in your school days, when you when you were dabbling in what some call maybe a garage band kind of uh, in that setting in high school and things that everybody kind of grows up in, um, what can you tell us a little bit about your experiences coming up in that kind of culture and how did you progress from that to like a studio level musician? Well, um, I played in a couple of bands in high school. Uncle Sam and the Frogs was one. <laughs> nice. And, uh, we had some good guys in that band. Uh, what kind of music would you? It describe? was rock. Yeah. Know, okay. Cool. Played. I heard there was a fire truck involved. I grew, yeah. I lived at a fire station growing up, and uh, <laughs> would sit out on the fire truck 
in practice. We, I grew up in a little town right outside Little Rock, and it was all volunteer fire department except for my dad, who was a full-time employee for the city. So oh, wow. we lived actually lived at the fire station. Mm. And I had the fire truck out there, and it was fun to go out there and sit on the so. fire truck and play guitar. But uh, played some hot tunes. <laughs> we played uh, all through high Put school, ups. Uncle Sam and the Frogs, and then I was in another band called the Barons. Yeah. And uh, another rock act. Another rock band. I've yeah. played. I had a Stratocaster. Uh, wow that my dad bought for me. It was a uh, 67. Yeah. Which probably worth something now, but yeah, I, sure it is. I don't have it anymore. I used, to have to, I used to have a 62. It was a cool instrument. I had a 2001 once. Nice. That was a good year. I've seen pictures of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always, I loved all kinds of music growing up. You know, I, I liked listening to the Beatles, of course. Yeah, sure. The, and all the bands that came out during that time, and uh, but also like classical music as well. You know, I was a big fan of the Lawrence Welk show, mm -hmm. and they had some incredible musicians on that show. Yeah, they sure did. Um, and you fixing to say something? Go ahead, brother. Um, so I I didn't plan on picking up other things. I didn't. You know, when I was in high school, I didn't think I'm going to learn how to play the classical guitar. I hadn't actually been exposed to that so much. Yeah. But but then I saw a couple of shows, like I said, on the PBS, and, and it just really caught my attention. Um, were they advertising the like Robert Guthrie in Dallas on the no, show? No, they were. Or? It was. Uh, I think I'd seen it in Dallas when I was in elect going to electronic school and oh, it was uh, on the KERA and they just had a local guy that was playing some stuff and I thought that's you yeah. know what I wanted to do yeah for sure well uh, in terms of the classical guitar though I think that the uh, techniques that I learned and uh, the uh, practice regimen is a thing that helped me develop to be able to pick up other instruments yeah. and learn how to adapt as far as in terms of practicing, you know, yeah. you learn how to focus on certain techniques and uh, makes it easier, I think, to pick up some of the other instruments. That's a good foundation. Uh, when, when you've played with other people, um, or, or was there a moment when, you know, you've always wanted to, to be a, a guitarist, is, was there a moment when it went through your mind, hey, I'm actually doing what I wanted to do? Like you, you finally came to the realization or you were doing that so much that that uh, you realized that's where you were? Uh, that's just happened recently. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, because it's... So you had a big idea a, of where that was going to go. I music guess. is a, a struggle, you know, to yeah. be able to make a living... I feel really fortunate, but I remember thinking when I was a kid, I didn't have any experience at all, but I thought when I was a little kid, I thought, you know, it'd be fun to work in a recording studio, and here we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, but studio I didn't, 333. Yeah, That's right. I, I didn't ever imagine that that would be something that I would actually do to make a living. And uh, teaching, I taught for about 15 years, and gradually made a transition. I had a guy that uh, said there, he knew of a studio where they needed some string parts. And I just said, yeah, I'll go do that. So I took a shot at it and ended up working at a studio in Dallas part-time. Cool. What was the name of the studio? Reel to Reel. Okay. Well, hey, uh, kind of you said a couple of things that got me thinking a little bit. Um, uh You've got it, as we mentioned. You've got an impressive discography as a studio musician, uh, obviously, uh, but you've also done a lot of really cool uh, live stuff, uh, going out with a lot of people uh, in a live setting as as well. So, do you primarily think of yourself as a studio musician or a live musician? And uh, which one do you enjoy the most? Maybe is the is the 
because obviously you do both, but which one do you enjoy the most and why? Well, I think the, the studio setting for me works better. Um, I think when I can actually have time to spend working up a part and then, you know, get it the, the way I want it to sound, yeah. I think that that's uh, more satisfying. I'm not really as adept at, at playing off the cuff. It's just, you know, I think one of the reasons why it, that is is because I started uh, steel guitar and fiddle in my 30s. Right. As a, you know, a lot of the guys that, that play those instruments start when they're little bitty kids. Sure. You know, so. By the way, I just have to interrupt and to say that what Milo just said there is an absolute lie. <laughs> because I have recorded him so many times where I just I just say, all right, we're going for this kind of thing. All right, get in there, hit record, and just like the first thing that comes out on steel or fiddle or whatever is just like brilliant and amazing. So Milo's being uh he's being humble, but uh No, I'm I'm just more comfortable in the studio. I yeah. Think. I mean I like playing and it's I more think, of a laboratory, you know, it's kind of like the laboratory. And yeah. I, I mean, I get that. I mean, that's, uh, I know myself, the kind of musician I am, I'm much more comfortable in the laboratory, you know. Is, some, is anxiety some of the some of the differences in that, too, in, in your enjoyment level between the uh, two? Well, I have I have anxiety in the studio, too. I was, I'm as nervous as hell all day today. But, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think, I don't think anymore so much anxiety but the live performing i think is good and if you you know have an opportunity to do that often enough it's really good for your technique because yeah. you then you have an opportunity to practice some stuff yeah i mean you obviously play a lot of live gigs but you've done a number of like extensive you know world tours as well like uh don henley y'all have done and you're about to go out again i guess in a couple of weeks with yeah. don right yeah. and uh leanne rhymes you guys probably toured I don't know how many dates did you tour with Leanne Rhymes, a bunch. I bet that was crazy. We did quite a few. Yeah, I bet uh, so. The first, I think that was uh, about a three-year thing, and she had just... Yeah, you, you probably know, did 600-plus dates in, in three years, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have a really good question that could probably help a lot of younger musicians out there with your experience. Um, how, how did you overcome the, the anxiety? I know you say that... You know, you, even today you were kind of nervous and things like that. But from a creative standpoint, how do you get through that anxiety to still reach the goal? What can you tell other musicians that might be feeling the same kind of things? Uh, well, there, there's really no substitute for practice and uh, preparation. And if you, when you're in a setting where you're on the spot, uh you get to where you you realize what your limitations are and don't try to exceed that when it when it matters you know yeah. so yeah um you've got your bag of tricks yeah and, and you get it in as big a bag you know, as you can when you, you know? stay with that yeah. then you're safe and if you if you find yourself in a in a studio setting and you get to the point where you realize you don't have to get it right the first time you can yeah. punch in then you can you know, stretch out a little bit and try some different things. And, right. uh, but in in a live setting, I think for me, what worked is just to stay with stuff that I knew I was comfortable just with. Just don't travel know. too too far outside. Yeah, and uh, but there again, there's no substitute for wood shedding and spending a lot of time, you for know, sure. in the practice room. Um, I've got a question, uh, kind of back, you know, you mentioned a couple of the early bands that you played with, but what, somewhere along the way, you got a gig, I'm sure, where you thought to yourself, this could lead somewhere. I mean, uh, obviously when you, uh, may, maybe that's when you uh, got the Leanne Rhymes gig, I don't know, of course she was a debut artist, so, um, what, what was that gig where you thought to yourself, you know what, this may be heading somewhere, I may be able to do this for a living? Well, uh... I met some guys, actually some the guys that were working over at the Real to Real Studio when I went over there, and uh, a couple of the guys that worked there had a band, and uh, the uh, uh, singer's name was Ted Tedford. He's from Athens, Texas, and his brother played bass, and uh, there was a guy Ron Morgan from Gilmer. Okay, he played guitar, and uh, uh, 
drummer from Tyler named Brad Smith. Well, they all were working in Dallas, and the, they had gotten into the studio scene in Dallas. But they had a country band just playing. Yeah, just doing clubs dates. at yeah. night, yeah. and uh, asked me to play. I started out playing rhythm guitar and upright piano in that band, but it was so much fun, and we played, you know, five nights a week for fifty bucks a night. Yeah, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I could do this. Yeah. Yeah, you thought that that was it. You know, what, <laughs> that was, was it? Good wasn't when Jack Ingram called or Leanne Rhymes. It was. Well, that was. It was Ted that Tedford. Was, that was a while later. Um, yeah, I played with Ted and that band. Uh, the name of that band was Ted Tedford and the Flying Cow Chips. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was. <laughs> and I played with Ted for about ten years. So, were you one of the? Cow chips. I was a cow chip. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. And actually, a flying in, cow chip. Right. In that band, I, I learned how to play the steel and fiddle at the expense of the band. Oh, okay. That's where you cut your teeth, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So that was. Uh, you, you must have been fairly proficient right off the bat. No. There. No, it was awful. Enough to fool them, maybe? No. No. I didn't <laughs> fool anybody, but they were patient. And, I mean, the place that we played. Uh, they would. They didn't know the difference. You know, yeah, so. right. They were. They were a little bit too intoxicated to notice, perhaps. Yeah, but um, so I played with Ted for about ten years, and, and gradually was able to uh, somehow work my way into the studio scene in Dallas. Yeah, and uh, kept working on those instruments. Uh, actually, started playing steel guitar because I developed carpal tunnel. From classical guitar, really? practicing so much, yeah, and uh, interesting. So I don't know. It just led to well, a bad thing led to a good thing. <laughs> did you have to have corrective surgery on that, or did it no? I just I wore off? braces, wrist braces, for about a year and uh, quit playing the guitar so much and uh, started working on steel guitar and yeah. Uh, had some lessons with uh, Maurice Anderson. He was a, a real well-renowned steel player that lived in Dallas. And uh, is he still alive? No. Okay. No, he's he passed. passed away a couple of years ago. All right. Well, one of your uh, many credits is co-writing and playing guitar and fiddle on the well-known Motel Six jingle. You know where they leave the light on. Um, that there has to be a good story there somewhere. How did that come about? Well, I was working. Uh, for uh, a music production uh, company in Dallas, Tom Faulkner Music, and we'd done a lot of regional and national commercials. Right. Uh, and he would hire me as a ranger and also to play on a lot of his commercials. We did all kind of stuff, American Airlines, Dr. Pepper, uh, Pace Picani sauce, <laughs> just any right. number of things. And um, the Richards Group, an advertising agency there in Dallas, contacted him, and we just uh, put that together. So when you hear that on the TV or something, does it make you smile? Or is it just well, another? I, I like just... the fact that we recorded that in 1988, and I still get quarterly payment. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah, quarterlies are nice. So it probably does make you smile then. Yeah, I mean, it's not not what it Four was. Four times a year. What it was back in uh, the late 80s. Right. But, it, but still, they still run it, though. Yeah, so it's been good. It's I mean, I've heard good. I've heard it in the last three months and looked over at my kids and said, hey, that's my little thing. They replaced Tom, though, but they kept the jingle. Yeah, right. Yes, they did. Yeah. They reworked the... The voiceover, you know, every so often, and but they're still using that same music. So. Yeah, been good to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, as an in-demand studio musician, you said you got into the Dallas studio system. Obviously, at this point, uh, you're well established to say the least. Uh, you're certainly, uh, as I say, an in-demand studio musician. Well, uh, what are some of your favorite studios to work in, and why? For some of those folks that. Uh, that are kind of gear junkies and what's uh, the name of this studio? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have to ask, it is not on the list. <laughs> the three three three. It's divisible that's by right. nine. That's right. Studio three 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 obviously is your most favorite, but I mean besides that, of course. Divisible by nine. <laughs> well, uh, Dallas has some good studios. Yeah, they do. They've got 
you know, and it's and the studio business is hard because everybody so nice. in music now has a home studio That's as right. well, you know, and so right. I know some of the some of the bigger studios up there have struggled, uh, but I would work in Dallas and work at Crystal Clear, uh, Loomis, um, Audio Dallas is good. Yeah. Uh, Panhandle over in uh, Panhandle Denton is a Denton. cool place. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a studio up in uh, Aubrey, uh, Abstract Audio. Oh, I don't know that one. It's a nice studio. Of course, you're wearing, folks can't see it, but I you're wearing uh, Fort Worth Fort uh, Sound. Worth sound, I go to that's Fort a, Worth. That's a hip there. joint, yeah. Uh, SG Studio in Fort Worth is good. It's in White Settlement. Cool. And uh, come to Tyler, work at Rosewood. Yeah, right. I know you some. spend a lot of time over there, sure. And then when I, uh, I guess when I first started working with you, I was at a place in Granbury, for any of you folks that know where that is, about 45 miles southwest of Fort Worth, a little place called Fossil Tracks Recording. We made a lot of records over there, didn't we? It was we? good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had some good times. And then now here in um, Bullard, Texas, the uh, the Metropolis Bullard, Texas, Studio 333, you know, this is where all the action happens. Does this studio have another name besides 333? No, should it? Is I'm just it's affiliated with Keeper Soul. Oh, I Keeper see what you're saying. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a part of uh, Keeper Soul. Uh, and if I may, Chad Malden please. Productions. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, Malden Productions. But yeah, but basically, the uh, the facility belongs to uh, Keeper Soul, which is a winery and a vineyard mm-hmm. and a number of other things as well. And it was kind of the brainchild or the That's vision it. of Pierre Dewitt, who sadly passed away just a few yes. months ago. It was uh, it was a real shock. But he was a passionate guy. Everybody loved him. And he loved music very much. And yeah. uh, so this was kind of his brainchild. So it's neat to be able to still work out of this, do my productions out of this studio, and uh, kind of keep that legacy going because he really had a passion for music. So it's a neat place. Well, this studio sounds great. Yeah. It really does. And just look at how pretty it is. It is pretty. Uh, I wish the folks could see. <laughs> Y'all give me a call. You can come out and uh, take a tour sometime. <laughs> well, we certainly dumbed it down with Nathan and I being here today, but- Oh, no. Well, I, well, it, meaning that I had to escort him into the building. No. <laughs> if, you, if you mean that I left the door open for you. All right. right, right. Well, Milo, could you tell our listeners, listeners about the difference in the business between when you first broke in and now? I mean, like how has technology helped or hurt the business overall? When I started recording, of course, uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s, Everyone, we were still using tape. Right. Uh, and I think that... Which uh, sounds amazing, by the mm-hmm. way. It does. If you but, know how to use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and gradually, uh, as time progressed from that point to now, there was a tr- the transition to computer audio, yeah. which you, I don't think that there's any comparison in terms of flexibility, what no. we can do now with the... Mm-hmm. Uh, with the computer and the sound digital audio sounds great you know it does I mean, now it's yeah. really really clean and i know that there's a been a a little bit of a novelty to go back to the vinyl yeah but i don't i don't think it's gonna stick stick i think because uh it doesn't i mean i don't know anybody that's got a turntable in their car <laughs> no so it's true it's not nearly as convenient. It's but some people do have turntables uh, like sitting beside them on a counter. Hey, I don't there's know. one right here. Oh, there's one right here. There's <laughs> one right there. Look at that. Do you have any vinyl records? I do. Uh, vinyl is, is technology, is it, has it hurt the yes, business right. at all either? Uh, well, I think... Is there know, a downside, the, in other words? Yeah, is there yeah, a downside? I, to I the, think that the more, more, ease at which you can download music now, of course, is hurt record sales. Yeah, Artists right. struggle, you know, to make money. And uh, it's it's really hard to make money selling, yeah. when, whereas it used to be artists could make a lot of money selling. Right now, you've got to go out and play pretty right. much. You know, that's where that's in the touring now, more or less your, than yeah, the recording. Your uh, recordings are more of just advertisement for your live shows. Right? Yeah, it's really your swapped places. You know, I mean, it used to, I mean, I know when I was a kid growing up going to concerts, I mean, they were pretty affordable, not just because it was 100 years ago, but because they were trying, they were promoting their album. How old are you? 
I'm no, 43. No. <laughs> <laughs> they were promoting their album. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why they went on tour. But now people make albums to promote their live shows. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really just a, a, a different focus for why you should make a record now. They perform now to promote their T-shirts. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> That's right. I mean, people still buy music. I mean, I, sometimes people kind of overstate that problem. I mean, it's a lot less than it used to be, but people still buy records. But there's there's definitely a shift of focus for the, why you make records now. The ease of digital has put it has placed more competition out there. People who hardly know how to play have a full album. Well, not only that, but they made it's it's made it easier to just kind of get content out there with the YouTubes and you know Facebook video, live video, things like that. I mean, anybody in their bedroom, their bathroom, wherever, they can post a video of them performing or whatever. So what do you think, Milo? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, there's there's an upside to that. You know, the fact that there's so much more music that you can access now that you would have never heard before. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's probably some of each, but what do you think? I think some of each. Uh, I think one of the drawbacks these days is, uh, you know, you, you hear... Like somebody sends you a, a song that says, listen to this, that they've recorded, and you're listening to it on your telephone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think uh, in a way that that's hurt the audio business. Yeah. Because uh, some, you know, kids will, especially coming up, will think, well, I can record a thing and don't have to really pay that much attention to the quality. Right. I think that yeah. that can hurt uh, the business. And then also, with the all the technology that you you know things you can do on the computer now, it to me it's like there maybe isn't as much emphasis on really learning how to play yeah. an instrument as there used to be. Like you didn't have a choice before if you wanted to have a guitar yeah. on a recording, you had to learn how to play it or hire somebody that did. And now. Yeah. Everything is synthesized. I mean, yeah. you can even get pedal steel samples, you know? Yeah. And, so you and kind of think maybe so, the talent's disappearing a little bit? Well, I mean, there's still plenty of great players out there. I wouldn't say that, but it's. I think that there's uh, that danger is there. What I mean is, do you, do you think musicians might be getting lazy as a whole? I mean, just because... I think the four of us... Seem pretty lazy. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that 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 could be a you know a problem with the the trend. Yeah, because I mean, if there if there's more samples and more ways around things, I think people tend to always try to take the the easiest road, even if it's not maybe the best sounding or you know. Well, I remember, you know, like you mentioned tape and the way, you know, we used to have to record. And uh, when I first came into the business, I was just on the kind of the bubble of all that. And, you know, the difference is, and I think it's what you were alluding to, Milo, is that, you know, people had to have performances in the studio. Like they had to be able to play the song. You know, now you can really chop it up and do all kinds of wild stuff. But uh, you had to get a performance. The thought of stopping in the middle of a song and coming in on a drum take or something was just unheard of. I mean, you, I mean, it was basically... It wasn't impossible, but you didn't really do it. I remember there's a local musician that just passed away, Uncle Dallas. Yes, sir. And uh, back in the day when I was just a young, budding engineer, I was in the studio with some local band. He was playing drums. And uh, we were on the last song. It was very late. And we had to get the song all the way through. I mean, that's just the way it was. And uh, they kept, this band kept messing up the last, you know, eight bars of the song. You know, we had about 10 takes under our belt. And uh, Uncle Dallas, for those of you guys that know who that is, a lot of y'all in this area do. He had a real laid back way. He leaned into one of the overhead mics and said, all right, boys, uh, I hope we get it this time because I'm going home after this. <laughs> and we got it, you that know. But I mean, you had like to him. get a take back then, but that's not how it is anymore, is it? No. And, uh, I mean, even more and more, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll hear a record and the musicians never were even in the room at the same time. Yeah, It's right. all pieced together. Yeah. Uh, and I think I have a lot of respect if you for the go back and listen to some of the recordings that were made in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. Before they you could punch in sure. and, and have multi tracking. And overdubs. And they had to be able to play and sing in tune. Yes. Mm-hmm. There wasn't or it didn't All of them at the same time. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> some of those uh recordings back then that are that are so amazing and they they actually could do that sure you know and not rely on electronics 
to make it happen. Well, Milo, talk about you just recently made, uh, not only have you just been on tour with Don Henley, but you just made his last album. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a great album, Americana kind of country album. It's not far from here. Can no, it's not. <laughs> oh, it's Jefferson, uh, not Jefferson, Linden, uh, Linden and Avenger yeah. out there. Yeah, Northeast so, Texas. Yeah. So you just made that album, just kind of on the heels of what we were talking about with technology and so forth. How was that album? Uh, how was that album made, and what was that experience like? And uh, what do you think about the sort of the process of making that Don Henley album most recently? Um, well, I was real excited to get to be a part of that. Um, I worked at a stu- have worked for quite a while at a studio, Luminous. Sure, um, it's a big operation, yeah. And uh, in Dallas, and uh, is that where the album was cut? A lot of the early tracks okay. were cut. And the basic this tracks. was like six years ago. I got a call. Oh, I didn't realize it dated that far back. Yeah, yeah. so it was a long project. Okay, I didn't yeah. realize. Um, engineer uh, Chris Bell. Yeah, sh- sure, of course. Who, I think he's in Shreveport now. At uh, Blade? Is he the one at Blade? I believe so. Yeah, that's a nice place too. Well, he was on staff there at Luminous and uh, they were cutting tracks. And by the way, just yeah. let me just interrupt for a moment. For those of you who don't know, when, when Milo says uh, the, the, the basic tracks or cutting tracks six years ago, he's talking about uh, when you're making an album, that's the core of the, like the rhythm section. You know, you're sort of yeah. getting the rhythm section, which I guess for a pop band or a rock band, Bass guitar and drums, maybe piano. Bass guitar, drums, yeah. Rhythm guitar. Not, not, not necessarily all the extra embellishments, but that core essential part. So that was done at Luminous. They had, uh, I believe, four, four or five songs that they had started that uh, Henley had written, and I got a call to come in and play steel guitar on those. And uh, um, actually, I'm trying to think back. That that first session that I was in, they they had uh, a full band. Actually, was there? I'm remembering now. And Don, and it was surreal hearing his vocal come through my headphones. I, I hadn't seen him yet, but he was back in a booth somewhere yeah. singing. And uh, they started, and it You'd was sort of pinch yourself, maybe. <laughs> I'm like I can't believe this is happening. Uh, <laughs> and um. We spent all day, I think, on two songs, trying to get it where they were happy with it. And uh, then about three or four months later, I got another call to come in and work on a couple more. And that, and then from there, they cut uh, some rhythm tracks in Nashville yeah. and did some stuff there. But I still was, I was going to his house to do overdubs. Okay. He had a home um, studio. He had a studio set up in his living room. His Dallas house. Yeah. Or home, I should say, yeah. And uh, um, Stan Lynch, who had played drums for sure. Tom Petty, he was producing. And really He's nice done style. several, a couple albums for Don, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Don was real easy to work for. Um, How was Stan Lynch, by the way? I'm a huge Tom Petty great. fan. He was great, yeah. yeah. He, was, he was really good. And I still actually still working uh, with Don. He was uh, when we played the Austin City Limits last September, which was a great performance, by the Stan way. Stan was there and and actually produced the uh, audio and mixed the audio for that show. That sounds great. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen that, there's some uh, you can see some clips on Austin City Limits website. Yeah, you've got a lot of experience playing that the Austin City Limits too, right? Uh, I've done it, uh, played the old Austin City Limits. They're in a new location now. Right. I played the old Austin City Limits uh, with Jack Ingram and also that same uh, theater with uh, Trout Fishing in America. That's back in the 90s. Yeah, back in the back 90s. Back in the 90s. Right. Back in the, that was TNN, right? The old TNN? Yeah. Wasn't that what they, uh, they uh, put that out on? Remember the Nashville Network? Oh, yeah, maybe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I guess uh, PBS uh, airs a lot of those Austin City right, Limits right. episodes, right? Yeah, for real. You mentioned earlier that uh, um, you brought up the Beatles. And uh, when reading your bio, one of the things I was most interested about was Beetlegrass. Can you tell us a little oh, bit yeah, about that? Beetlegrass. That was a lot of fun. I miss those guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that 
band was the uh, brainchild of uh, Dave Walser, who has a studio uh, in Dallas. Uh, I think it's Blue Moon Recording. But we were working, we had studio suites next to each other, and he approached me with the idea to do a bluegrass Beatles. He was a big Beatles fan. and uh, So we put that band together 2003, I believe, and uh, it was three of us, uh, Dave Walser, myself, and the bass player George Anderson. We played it upright. And how did that come about? Did it just say, hey, we're going to play some Beatles? And well, we started we started by just doing an album. He wanted to just record, and we recorded 10 songs and then felt like we can have a CD release, you know? It would be fun just to try to play it live, so we rehearsed right. for a couple of months. Did you guys take that over to Ireland and stuff, too? Yeah. Is that what I read? Yeah, we went to Ireland and did two weeks over there. Uh, we'd been together for five or six years at that point and uh, had a, a, a pretty good show worked up, you know. We were hilarious. Your version of uh, Blackbird was very nice. Is there a way for us, uh, us being us three, but also our listeners, for us to uh, hear that that stuff from Beetlegrass or purchase it? Or I made an album, but is it available well, got, anywhere? We anymore? actually have... Uh, Just play it now, man. You know, three or four <laughs> albums. We have a lot of clips on YouTube. Okay. Um, and uh, there are a couple of my favorite clips uh, from for the Beetlegrass band was uh, the song She Loves You. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's got a pretty good performance of that uh, at the McDavid studio, which is at the Bass Hall in Fort Worth. Oh, yeah, it's a great venue. Uh, we actually have a couple of uh, rehearsal YouTube videos that I think turned out good. One of them we're doing, uh, oh, it's what's that Paul McCartney song? I can't think of the name of the song. Thriller? No. no. <laughs> Wrong artist. Well, he does own that, though. <laughs> yeah. Paul, McCartney <laughs> Paul owns it. Uh, we've got one of uh, Because it's, that I think turned out pretty good. So YouTube, yeah, we've got Beetlegrass on YouTube. Are there albums available as well? Or they are. I'm not sure if uh, there. We did have a website, and I believe Dave was selling those off the website. I'm not sure now. I haven't. Uh, we haven't done anything since 2010, so it's been a while since we played. Yeah, right. There are albums though. Okay. If somebody wants a Beetlegrass album, then they should write me. There you go. Okay. I think I have some in my... And that that's, I believe that's Beetlegrass with one S as well. Yeah. Just so people will know to search for that. So would it be Beetlegrass? Beetlegrass. Beetlegrass. <laughs> Beetlegrass. <laughs> right. Yeah, it Beetle depends Grass. on uh, who you're hanging out with, right? Myself, yeah. I just, I thought it was very interesting to see like a different kind of concept, you know? I mean, I've heard... Now, there's like Hey C Dixie, you know, where sure. they where they do the the bluegrass of A C D C but I'd never heard that with the Beatles. And then to see it kind of morph into Ireland and in the UK where they came from and it actually obviously did well over there, you know. I was I was really intrigued by that. We had a lot of fun when we went to Ireland. They they uh we got good response and played some festivals and some pubs and that was a, a hoot to get bet, over there yeah. and play. Well, cool. I tell you what. Uh, why don't we? Uh, we're forty-five minutes into this thing, so uh, we. Uh, well, I did have one last question. Oh, you've got a good one. Okay. And well, I think this is. Um, uh, I think uh, this might be important to Milo because this is his annual thing in Dallas. Sure. Um, tell us a little bit about the Acoustic Kitchen Band and your annual Christmas Jam concert that y'all put on in Dallas. I believe ten years. Uh, was 2013 so yeah we have i did uh in 2003 a christmas album I, which is know, amazing by the way well it you should out, check it out <laughs> i just love christmas music i think some of the best songwriting you know the the melodies are beautiful and uh, uh i wanted to do that album an acoustic version of some of my favorite christmas carols so in 2003 i did volume one and 
and uh, we did a CD release party that turned into an annual Christmas show that yeah. we've done every year. Um, and in 2005, I did another Christmas album, Volume 2. Yes. <laughs> Strangely named. see where you're going with this. Yeah. 2009, I did Volume 3, and uh, working on Volume 4 right now. Cool. So, uh, and then the Acoustic Kitchen Band actually started out as being – uh, myself and my kids uh, and my wife Rachel she sang played guitar Scarlett my daughter plays uh, fiddle and Savannah my youngest child plays a bass so we that was the acoustic kitchen band starting out uh, well they've grown up and now I can't get them to sit still you know, <laughs> right. to play with old dad and is that is that Christmas concert is that located in the same spot every year or? Uh, we've been we've had it at uh, Fort David's okay now the last year we took last year off because I was on tour and, oh that's right uh, you were that's yeah, when you were I'd out just with- gotten back from the uh, touring with uh, Don yeah and so we didn't. We actually didn't do one last year, uh, but we've had, yeah, ten years without missing a beat. And it was it, we've had some good shows. Sure, and you just have a bunch of different guests come out and just have different a big guest jam. stars every time. You know, we have some return uh, guests. One of my favorite is uh, Robert Froner, who plays the saw and the theremin. Oh, that's wow. right. Yeah, yeah. How cool you is that? Have not lived until you've heard White Christmas on the theremin. <laughs> <laughs> I love the theremin. I mean, particularly in a rock setting, man. You know, this is a really cool instrument for sure. I guess if I guess you could call it an instrument. Uh, yeah, that's what it, it makes those uh, kind of sounds right. I used it back in the old science fiction movies. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, it's basically it is just kind of this. You just. You wave your hand in front of it, and the way, how fast, and the distance kind of creates the. Uh, it's got the two, intervals. It's got two antennas uh, on it that you. One of them you do this with back yeah. and forth for volume, and the other one you go up and down for, for pitch. pitch. Yeah. yeah. So it's, Joe Bonamassa uh, uses it a, uh, in his live show, and it's pretty cool. He's not the first, though. <laughs> I mean, the first, obviously, it's got to be you know Robert the. Robert Froner. He's. He's a retired radiologist that plays the saw and theremin. Look him up. There you in go. Arlington. There you and go. when you're looking up anybody, make sure you go to YouTube also. Milo Deering, that's D E E R I N G. The one you want to check out that my kids really loved was the Milo Hoedown. The Dixie Hoedown. The Dixie Hoedown. Yeah, Milo's Dixie Hoedown. And Milo's playing like seven or eight different instruments in there. He's going to rap to you a little bit. And. I can tell you that my kids were extremely entertained by that yesterday. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, I haven't ever used you on a rap session. I should uh, keep that in mind. I'm, I'm overlooking a, you, apparently. I have a special yeah. hat that I wear. Oh, you got to see the hat, oh. Chad. You have to see it. Yeah, it's part of the deal, I guess. And his classical violin in there as well, right after the rap. It's like, I'm going to go for as many genres as I can. I, I felt you there. I'm shameless. I'm, it's shameless pandering is <laughs> trying to hit all the different, all the right notes. Yeah, I loved it though, and the, the, like I said, I've got five teenagers at home, and five, yes, sir, and they all enjoyed it. I mean, the way my house works is we get home from school, and they all they're like boxers, you know, they all go to their own corners and and what have you. But I'm doing trying to do a little research on you, and I'm looking at your videos and things, and I think that was the third one that I played. The next thing you know, I've got five kids behind me watching. <laughs> And I was just like, hey, well, man, that's, that's pretty nice. cool. No. It was an endearing moment. There you okay. go. Oh, but I'm Where's sorry. the drum set? <laughs> okay, so here's here's a good, in my opinion, here's a good concluding question. All right, this really gives people a sense of who you are. Name, if you're able to just on the spot, we're putting you on the spot here. If you were able to name you know, like your top three albums uh, that, that you, know, you just think are great albums, um, what would you name? Milo Deering's top three albums. The Mount Rushmore of albums. That's right. Well, I would have to say probably uh, the Beatles' White Album. Sure. Had, I mean, 
I can't think of anything better than that. Uh, the uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Circle Be Unbroken. That yeah. They did wow. it with, uh, um, they had all the bluegrass greats, you know. Mother Maybell was on that album. Wow. Uh, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, Doc Watson. Wow. Uh, that was cut way back in the 70s. I have to go back and check that out. That's it's a I double album. That. You'll love it. It's really good. It's got Vassar Clements, wow. fiddle player. And, My dad's a bluegrasser. I, that sounds like a Christmas present right there. Yeah. I got to go find that one. Um, and then uh, the uh, Christmas album that Bing Crosby recorded that has White Christmas. Cool. And it has the Andrews Sisters. These are I all albums Andrews. that had That's a big influence on Christmas me. Songs. Yeah. Period. You know, um, it was just great. Still a great listen. That's awesome. Especially when it's snowing outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, Milo, we appreciate your time, brother. Thanks for having me. You guys. Illuminating. Really, Illuminating. Yes. Really say nice the least. fellas, in spite of what they say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. From Studio 333. Divisible by nine. That's right. Chad Malden here, music producer and mixing engineer for Malden Productions. You know, you've just been listening to this ETX Rocks podcast in Bullard, Texas at Studio 333 Recording Studio. It's an amazing facility, a hidden gem out here in East Texas. You know, I want you to go to my website to get more information. I want you to go to maldenprod.com. That's M-A-U-L-D-I-N. P-R-O-D, MaldenProd.com. And you can find out about me, folks I've worked with. You can hear samples of my work. But then you can also link over and find out more information about this great recording studio, this great facility. And so I want you to do that. I want you to go to the website, MaldenProd.com, get any information that you need. And then also feel free to reach out because we're happy to answer any questions that you have or chat about anything that you want to chat about. Thanks a lot. Everyone, thank you for listening to this week's episode of ETX Rocks, brought to you by Studio 333 in Bullard, Texas. You can see, you can find Studio 333 on Facebook, on their Facebook page, as well as Malden Productions. And don't forget, you can go to etxmusic.com and vote for all your favorite artists, venues, magazines, radio stations, etc. Right there, just click on the voting link and enter the person or people you want to vote for. Don't forget to support local music and ETX Rocks.